Hey, Pastor Bill, what's up? How you doing? Wait, who's Pastor Bill? You know Pastor Bill. Okay, are you pretending to know their pastor's name? There's definitely a Pastor Bill watching this right now. But what if there's not? Pastor Bill, I know you're watching this. What's up? How you doing, man? <laughs> okay, okay. I see what you're saying. It's kind of cool. Let me try it. Hey, Pastor... Nah, I can't do it. It doesn't feel right. Yeah, okay. Let's just move on. Let's just move on. Let's move on. Let's do this. <laughs> Hey, I totally understand the whole bill bit and yeah, your you hesitation do? to start this one, right now. you know, because today we're talking about one of the least discussed issues in the church and probably even at your home. Yeah, we're going to be talking about porn and masturbation, y'all. That's right. And before we even get started, there's something we should be very clear about. This is not just a topic that men need to hear. Women need to hear this, too. We all need to hear this. And that's because the porn industry spends billions of dollars every year trying to get us to view porn. And let's be clear on the definition of porn. Porn is any image, video, or writing you use to sexually arouse yourself. This can include Netflix, HBO, YouTube, your Instagram discovery feed, or any social media platform. Porn is not just something you see on adult websites. That's right. Those who are exposed and begin looking at porn habitually can sometimes become addicted. Pornographers have created a sophisticated system that's designed to transform the casual user into an addict. Even if you don't become addicted, you can find yourself in a cycle that rewires your brain, harms your relationship, and ultimately causes isolation and depression. Yeah, and pornography is not just wrong. It's actually destructive. It desensitizes the user, glorifies abusive sexual behavior, it demeans women, and damages one's sex life. Porn, quite literally, is destructive. We gotta remember where the teenage brain is at. It is like a Ferrari engine with Kia brakes. And so the adolescent brain is pumping out a bunch of dopamine. Dopamine is what drives learning and wiring in the brain. And the thing that drives dopamine is this idea of novelty. Novelty is a new pleasure, and that could be really anything. It could be a new image, it could be if somebody liked your post. It's any sense of reward or affirmation or stimulation. And so pornography is obviously filled with all of that. On the internet, you can click and you can click and you can click and you can click and you can click. And so you can keep actually this dopamine going at a soaring rate for hours and hours and hours. That's all called super novelty. The other way that pornography wires the brain is through this idea of super stimulus. This comes from a very crazy experiment where this guy Nico, a very smart guy, a Nobel Prize winner for this, he took plastic butterflies and regular female butterflies and put them in a cage. Then he let male butterflies into the cage and none of the male butterflies wanted to interact with the actual real female butterflies. They all went to the plastic female butterflies because he had enhanced them and took their sexual attributes to another level. And so one way that we've thought about, you know, why are we seeing so much uh, sexual dysfunction and erectile dysfunction from pornography? It really comes from this idea that pornography is a super normal stimulus. It's our plastic butterfly, in a sense, where if you have kids teens especially growing up where, again, they're wiring their brain to a screen, uh, not an actual person, their brain tells them sex equals screen. And that becomes sex in their mind. So that's the second way. The third way is through associations. And this is, uh, comes from Pavlov's experiment, you know, where he fed a dog, uh, rang a bell, and he kept doing that. And then eventually he just rang a bell and the do dog salivated. And so the dog brain basically said that the bell equaled food. Now, if your first experience is with pornography, you're alone, you're isolated, you're feeling um, shock, you're feeling confusion, all of that gets wired into an association in your mind. You know, you have the sex hardware, but it's looking for the software. So your mind says sex equals shame, sex equals isolation, uh, sex equals maybe if you do it when you're bored, sex equals bored. Maybe it happens to be if you're in, a, in your uh, room alone, your mind will tell you that the right thing to do right now is to look at porn because it's formed that association. 
I grew up in a, uh, a missionary household, so my parents were missionaries, and we, uh, since I was born, and Christianity was, was part of my life. Uh, I was introduced into that, and I stayed with that, uh, and that also became part of my identity, was that uh, Christian lifestyle. We were kind of the um, ideal Christian family where, where our values, our manners, their, their respect, everything like that was all lined up and everything was, was perfect. And so I was never known as the kid that messed up, but rather the kid that uh, other parents' kids wanted to hang out with because that was the, a good influence. Man, I must have been 11 years old, not even, 10. And an older brother of my friend uh, told me to come into the room and then I mean, Naive just walked in, whatever he was going to show me, and, and he ended, that was the first time I was introduced to porn. At the time that I saw that, I had no idea that that was even a thing. I didn't even know it was bad. I was pretty young. I had never been talked about that. Uh, that was never an issue that was even on the horizon that I even thought of. It was, it was brand new to me. Um, and so it didn't really have much of an impact on me at the time, but that kind of planted a seed um, and that later on would, would grow. Uh, so fast forward a few years, uh, it's the first time I got internet, which was um, a big deal, <laughs> mainly for Guitar Hero Online. Uh, and that kind of started a journey, probably an 11 or 12 year addiction uh, to pornography. Um, majority of that completely yeah, in silence. And because of that, I had this, this idea in my mind that I was the only person that struggled with it because I'd never heard people talking about it. I never heard people uh, having conversations and my parents talking to me about it, nothing. So I thought I was very alone in this journey. And I also knew enough to know that this wasn't right anymore. And this was something, a problem, and I didn't know how to fix that. Some say that the Bible doesn't talk about porn, so it can't be sin to watch it. That's partly true. Obviously, the Bible doesn't talk about watching a porn video since videos didn't exist back then. But Jesus does tell us anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. That's right. And the Bible also says that we are to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul and that we should put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature like sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. Kind of hard to put to death lustful desires while you're watching porn. My mom got me a journal when I was a kid and I was never interested in that. But one day I was again so bottled up that I saw this journal and I was like, I'm gonna start writing about what's going on because it's some sort of outlet uh, to, to just process with. So I was like, that's a good idea. So it started off with just day-to-day -day things, moved on to certain situations with my girlfriend, moved on to internal struggles, moved on to this, moved on to that. Eventually it just got to being, anytime something happened, explicit detail, I would write out everything that happened because it's just a way to, to release, finally. One day I had finished journaling or whatever and, and my friends had called me and I, I quickly finished up my journal entry and I threw it on my desk and I ran out the room. It, it, it landed open uh, on my desk and, and my mom uh, was coming in bringing laundry into my room um, and she, as she's put my laundry on my, my desk, she, she sees my journal lying open. Now, I really want to blame my mom a lot on this and I was so angry at the time, but there are words on there that jumped out. And now looking back onto it, I believe that it was the Holy Spirit like giving me what I asked, I truly asked for. I didn't want this situation, but if, if it wasn't for this situation, I would probably be where I am today. I had come home uh, from a trip, actually with the girlfriend I was with at the time. We all went up uh, camping together and I came home and uh, I come home to just my dad. This is very rare. <laughs> my dad, if, I'm, it's, if, if, it's, if it's ever my dad just by himself, I know kind of something's wrong. And so the first time in my life, I had a, a true conversation with my dad, a very real, raw, embarrassing conversation with my dad about something that most men struggle with. Um, and it was very emotional and I unloaded it all on him and I cried and, and uh, all this type of stuff. And he acted um, exactly the way the father should. I had all these preconceived notions about how he was gonna act and, and, and I think I'd be replayed that that reaction in my mind so many times that that had become reality. Um, and the enemy kind of used that to say like, he, he's not gonna love you still. He's not gonna react well. He's not gonna be proud of you for things that you've done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
and the total opposite happened. I mean, he, it was incredible. And it was the first time I felt so unbelievably safe around my dad. I felt grateful, I felt relieved, I felt, um, it, it was just a really good moment for me. And um, it sunk in, I never want this to happen again. Like, I never want this sexual temptation and, and struggle with pornography to ruin my life like this or ruin relationships. And I think that really drove home, like I cannot mess this up anymore because it's not worth it. And it hurts people more than I think it does. So porn is not your friend. It destroys your mind, how you think about sex, your view of other people, and especially women. And it goes against God's design for sexual behavior. It's both harmful and sinful. And yet, there is one positive thing I want to say about porn. What? What did you say that again? There's one positive thing I want to say about porn. Stay with me. Stay right, with me. Well, I know what I'm doing. Okay. I'll talk about that positive thing in just a minute. But first, I think we should talk about masturbation. Now that's an uncomfortable topic. Exactly, which is why we're talking about it today. And many churches have actually avoided talking about this topic. The first question that often comes up is, is masturbation a sin? I mean, if I masturbate while watching porn, then I think it's a sin because watching porn is obviously a sin. But what if you masturbate without watching porn? Yeah, well, biblically, lust is still a sin. And let's be honest, if you masturbate, you're probably not thinking about your favorite ice cream flavor, right? Yeah, okay, that's probably true. But what if someone masturbates and actually isn't lusting? I mean, it's unlikely, but still possible. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think we should first acknowledge that nowhere in the Bible does it say, thou shalt not masturbate. This is pretty interesting because, I mean, people were probably doing it during biblical times. Exactly. It's not like we invented masturbation after Jesus ascended into heaven. The fact that the Bible never even mentions it, let alone prohibits it, tells me that masturbation by itself isn't necessarily a sin. Lust is sin. Porn is sin. But masturbation in itself? I don't know if we can say it's always in every case sin since the Bible doesn't say it's sin. Yeah, remember, sex chemically bonds you with the person you're having sex with. So with masturbation, even though you're not having sex with someone, there's some bonding that's still occurring. Maybe not with the person, but with an action. So with masturbation, even though you're not having sex with someone, there's still bonding that's occurring. If masturbation turns into an ongoing habit, or especially an addiction, then that's going to do more harm than good. Mm -hmm. Second Peter says that people are enslaved to whatever defeats them. And I can see ongoing masturbation being something that enslaves us and ultimately defeats us. That's right. I was about seven years old when a friend of mine invited me over to her house and uh, introduced me to things that seven-year-olds shouldn't be introduced to. And that led to an awakening, a sexual awakening in me and in my body that I wasn't prepared to handle mentally. And that sent me into an addiction um, that lasted well over a decade uh, with sexual dysfunction, with just sexual brokenness. Um, that manifested with masturbation uh, when I was young, when I didn't even know what that was, what that word was. It ended up following into other friendships and then into other relationships. As I became a teenager and started dating, um, that sexual brokenness just was fueled by those relationships and became a part of the dysfunction in those relationships, those dating relationships as well. By night, I was just shame-filled, crippled mess, even though during the day, I seemed to have it all together. And this went on for a lot of years and through a lot of relationships without telling anyone. I didn't feel like I could tell my parents. Goodness, no, not my parents. I didn't feel like I could tell any of my friends or my youth workers. So it was just a secret that I bore, and Satan convinced me, did a really good job of convincing me that I was the only one who struggled with something so gross or so inappropriate or so terrible, and that God... God could forgive me, but nobody else would. And so I had to do this on my own. And so because I kept it with such secrecy, kept the lid on for so long, I thought maybe once I get married, it'll just go away. And so I did uh, out of college, met an amazing man who was a friend of mine for a lot of years. Um, and we were married and I thought, this is it. That's the end of my struggles. 
But unfortunately, that's not the case. With most secret sins, they follow us. We don't just leave them at the door when we enter into a new relationship. So at that time, I <laughs> told the Lord, I'm just done. I just, I need to be done with this. I, I don't want it in my life. I had, you know, prayed that he would take it away for years. But for some reason, at this point, I just knew this was a turning point in my life. So I checked into a hotel. I fasted all day. I went to the hotel and I prayed for hours and hours. This was my game plan. I just was going to sit there and I was going to pray and write out my prayers until God got sick of hearing me talk and gave me a breakthrough. And so somewhere late into the night, no angel showed up like room service at the door. There was no bright heavenly lights telling me that God had granted my request, but I just knew that something was different. There was a lightness in my soul and I knew something was different. And as I went back home after that little getaway and was faced with similar situations that would have led to sin in the past, I was able to not give in to that temptation. And I knew that God had, all along the ingredients for the miracle had been there, but for some reason at that point, God allowed me to open my eyes and see that I had all the tools that I needed for that miracle. And by God's grace, I've never gone back to that quagmire of sin. It's been 18 years now of being clean from that addiction. Okay, okay, Monica, now I'm dying to know. What was that one thing you were saying about the positive thing about pornography again? Okay, yes, I'm so glad you asked because it also applies to masturbation. The positive thing I'm thinking about is not about pornography itself. It's actually about the desire that drives us to view porn. Pornography is a misdirected attempt at finding intimacy, but our desire for intimacy, even sexual intimacy, is how God designed us. While porn is sinful and destructive, the longing for intimacy and sex is a good thing. We are trying to fill a God-shaped hole in our heart that simply cannot be filled with porn. So you're saying that we shouldn't feel shameful when we have sexual desires and crave intimacy. Mm -hmm. Which is the very thing that leads us to watch porn and masturbate. Exactly, and I'm so glad you mentioned shame. This is the most common and crippling emotion that Christians feel when they watch porn or masturbate. They are so ashamed of what they've done that they run and hide, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. And that's what shame does. It pushes us to hide and prevents us from actually being healed and forgiven. Shame keeps the sin in darkness where it will continue to fester and grow. Shame tells us that God is mad at us or disgusted at us. But the gospel tells us that God's not shocked at our sin and he's eager to forgive. When we go to him with our sin, he receives us with open arms. He's not just able to forgive, but he's eager to forgive. If you're trying to be accountable all by yourself, or if you're trying to have sexual integrity, or if you're trying to fight your porn addiction all by yourself, and you have no one to sharpen you and make you stronger, you're not gonna get very far on your own. Pornography, VR porn, whatever it is for you, is a terrible shortcut in your life. So let's say you're having a really difficult day at school. Let's say you're having a really difficult moment with your parents or good friends. Well, how are you going to resolve that difficulty? Well, what most people do is they go to a substance. Uh, it could be alcohol, it could be drugs, could be pornography. And so what you learn is that anytime I get onto this major highway called life, once I get into some traffic, once I get into some weather conditions that I don't know, well, I always take an exit to be able to get off. So whenever I'm feeling anxiety, I go to porn. Whenever I'm feeling angry, I go to porn. And so essentially you're taking a shortcut and then the more that you begin to lean and depend on that shortcut, the more it reinforces that you are a deeply anxious person who's unwanted, no one actually loves you. And so this thing that you're saying, well, I have the free choice to do whatever I want, uh, is actually a thief. The thing that you think you're free to pursue is actually the very thing that's robbing you from freedom, that's robbing you from meaningful relationships and knowing how to move through just the normal difficulties of life, like conflict, anger, uh, and anxiety. If you truly want a holy and healthy sexuality, it'll be good to build habits in your life so that porn and habitual masturbation don't destroy you. Here are a few things we've learned from people who have overcome habitual or addictive porn use. First, go to Jesus. Confess your sin to Jesus and believe that he gladly receives your confession. 
He's not ashamed of you. He delights in you. He doesn't delight in sin, but He delights in us even when we sin. Jesus made you with a desire for intimacy. He just wants us to live out those desires in a healthy and holy way. That's right. Second, find a trusted friend or mentor that can help keep you accountable. Someone who's going to model the posture of Jesus, who's not going to scold or shame you every time you look at porn, but one who's going to help you live a more flourishing, happy, porn-free life. Third, you will need to build in healthy habits that reduce your temptation to look at porn. And this is going to look different for each person, depending on the associations you may have created with your feelings, devices, and places, and even the times you look at porn. If you typically use social media to view porn on your phone, then consider deleting those apps from your phone. I know that sounds crazy, deleting your social apps, but if we really desire a healthy sexuality, we'll be vigilant to do what it takes to find true joy and satisfaction, something porn often promises but can never deliver on. Yeah, and if you're most tempted at night, then don't bring your phone into your bedroom at night. I guarantee limiting your screen time in general, and especially at night, will make you a much happier person for many different reasons. And we can't forget the most important thing of all, our prayer life. Mm -hmm. We have to seek God and ask Him to step into whatever void we are trying to fill. Now, with all these steps, none of these are fail-proof. If you're determined to watch porn, you're probably going to figure out a way to do it. But at the end of the day, you have to decide how you want to live out your sexuality in a way that honors and pleases God. Okay, so I want you to ask yourself, is this a silent struggle for you? If so, what have you done to address this? If it is a struggle, I want to encourage you to share this with a trusted adult. Okay guys, today's question. How has porn affected you personally or what impact do you see it having on our culture? 